the Mercury Theater on the air. Columbia Broadcasting System welcomes you to the 14th program in its weekly series featuring Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air. Tonight, this brilliant Broadway company turns from their cycle of dramatized literary classics to relive for us a stirring adventure of recent history. It is Orson Welles' own adaptation of Hell on Ice by Commander Edward Ellsberg, the gripping story of the disastrous early expedition to the North Pole. My name is Melville. As retired chief engineer of our Navy, fair share of honors come my way. The engines and boilers would still be Oregon 12,000 miles under forced draft to take a place in the battle line at San Diego were my creation. Since then, I've designed the engines for half the warships that show the American flag. But now, as I look back over my life, I can only humbly hope that the name of George Melville may be a little remembered as one who served under Captain DeLong on the last voyage of the steamship Jeanette. I still read and reread my log of that trip, though the ink's been dry near 30 years. Here's the first entry. July 8th, 1879. 3.40 p.m. Pacific time. Jeanette weighed anchor. Destination... The North Pole. Already below. Already below, Captain DeLong. What did I Ready, Chief? Ready, Captain. Have steam in the harbor? Yes, sir. The Navy has done a thorough job on the Jeanette. They built an extra sheeting around a hull of six-inch Oregon pine belted down with iron straps and a truss of massive beams across her blockheads. I remember noticing as soon as we were underway, Jeanette wallowed a bit in the waves instead of knifing them clean. But she was a small ship, 420 ton in displacement, 142 foot long, 25 feet in beam. And grossly overloaded with three years' provisions and bunkers full of coal. Remember the first roll call on deck. Bill Melville? Yes, sir. Bill Chip? Yes, sir. Chip, second in command. Fifteen years at the China Station. A small man with a beard like General Grant. Bill Denenhauer? Yes, sir. Denenhauer, our navigator. Twenty-nine years old. Heavy built. No previous Arctic experience, but... Served to navigate the fleet around the globe. Dr. Ambler? Yes, sir. Ambler, small but sturdy. High-ranking surgeon. Mr. Collins? Here. Yeah. Jerome Collins, a Herald reporter sent by Bennett for his own reasons as a meteorologist. One of our two civilians technically listed as seaman but quartered with the officers. The other was Newcomb, a scientist, a nervous, testy little fellow. Mr. Newcomb? Yes, sir. Forward, a crew of 23 all-Navy men, hand-picked, one Chinese cook. We steamed out the Golden Gate, and cheering crowds were black on Telegraph Hill. Mr. Melville, the captain wants to see you on the bridge today. All right. I'll never forget seeing him on the bridge together. George Washington DeLong. Scholarly appearing man with glasses, commander of naval vessels for 20 years on the seven seas. And by his side, with her pretty head flung back, Emma DeLong. Chief, I want you to meet Mrs. DeLong before she deserts her husband. How do you do? Glad to meet you, ma'am. Mr. Melville, tell me, what do you think of a husband who'd rather go off to the North Pole than stay home with his wife? Being a bachelor, I don't know if I can say, Mrs. DeLong. No, Emma, the chief will think you really don't want me to go. <laughs> and now, George, something I have for you. And no, no, stay here, Mr. Melville. Right. I want you to be a witty. It's your flag. Mm hmm I want you to unfurl it at the... Yes. At the 
point farthest north. The point farthest north. The North Star, George. I'll watch it and we'll be looking at the same thing. Things equal to the same thing. Remember your geometry, Captain? I'll remember. Well? Chief, take care of him. And good luck. You sure will. I'll ride over to the yacht with you. For a few brief minutes, the Jeanette rolled in the swells while our starboard whaleboat was man-lowered and shoved off, carrying towards a lone yacht which now lay off to our quarter, Emma DeLong and her husband. A brief embrace, and DeLong, balancing himself on the thwarts, handed his wife up over the low side of the yacht. Another moment, and seated in the stern sheet of the whaleboat, DeLong was once more simply the sailor. Sharply, his commands traveled across the waves. And our whaleboat came back to us, rounded two under the davits, and was hoisted aboard. And then we got underway. For a few minutes, with strained eyes, I watched a white handkerchief fluttering across the water at us. And it faded in the distance. For our passage to Alaska, there's not much in my journal. August 2nd, with the aid of a tow hook. Baited with salt pork, our scientist Newcomb bagged an albatross. Crew none too pleased. The ancient superstitions of the sea persist even to the day of steamships. August 14th. Course set north by northwest. Through Bering Straits and into the Arctic Sea. And off the coast of Alaska toward Wrangell Island. September 2nd. Stray ice drifts sighted two miles to port. September 4th. Ice flows increasing. Surprising for this time of year. September 6th. Ice! Ice hole! Ice hole! Captain, Captain! Erickson, where is it? It's ahead, Captain. And on the way the bow. Mr. Chip, ice ahead! Ice! Having a hard to leave. Every man to his place. Hard to leave. Every man to his place. Bring her past, Jip. Closing fast. No use, sir. She won't clear it. Ice 200 feet ahead. Ice to starboard. We're going to strike, Captain. Try the engine. There, Chief. Yes, sir. We try the engine. Ready, Chief? Yes, sir. Hold steam astern. Well, we struck that ice pack head on. Lucky for us, that 19-inch planking of the floor would have stubbed us in. As far as we could see, the pack was unbroken. Except in back of us. A narrow lane of open sea. Supper that night was a somber meal. Here was ice only 240 miles north of Siberia, latitude 71 degrees, 30 minutes, where it had no business to be at this time of the year. Finally, the captain, chewing earnestly away on his mutton, broke a silence that was almost as solid as the ice pack. Well, Mr. Chip, do you think by morning we'll find a lead to this ice to Wrangell Island? No, Captain. We won't. You seem pretty certain, Mr. Chip. And what's more, while well, God's given you a chance, I'd back the Jeanette into that little hole astern and head out of this ice pack to open water before the bottom drops out of the thermometer and we're frozen in. What do the rest of you think? Got an hour? What do you think? You're a navigator. I think that Chinese cook's cough is even worse than usual, sir. <laughs> All water and no coffee beans. <laughs> what do you say, Chief? Yeah, maybe our Sam's saving coffee. In case the ice pack holds. Collins here seems to be able to drink his. What I drink is my own affair. Oh, don't take it so hard, Collins. Yeah, Sam. Yes, sir. 
Ah, uh, Sam, you call this coffee. It tastes like the Arctic Ocean. All the same water make coffee? Scoop up and pail? I thought so. Doctor, how about that? Salt water coffee. You can't use salt water, uh, Sam. You've got to distill it. Or we'll all be done with the scurvy before we're off this ice. We're not on it yet, Doc. A heavy gale would break up this pack. And break the Jeanette along with it. Well, what better can we do, Mr. Chip? We can back out this lane and then head east. A whaler will stay in open water further north than this on the Alaska side. No use, pilot. We're not whaling and we'll not go east. We're heading for Wrangell Island. It's our only chance to make the pole. More coffee, anybody? Next morning, it was too late. During the night, the temperature fell to 23 below. Young ice forming over the open patches of water cemented together the old pack with the Jeanette stranded in the middle. At noon, we were ordered to the captain's quarters. Gentlemen, it looks bad. Tied up in the ice before summer's over. We've got to break loose. Chief, how long will it take to get steam up? A half hour, sir. Break the fires and hurry it up. Ten an hour? Yes, sir. Take soundings of the ice. Get the direction of his grip. Yes, sir. Chip, pick your men from the crew and prepare to dynamite the ice around the rudder. We'll try it, sir. The next three hours, we nearly tore the engines off their bed plates from the smoking thrust block off its foundation while the Jeanette rammed, squeezed, backed, and butted her way through the ice. Go ahead! That night, the temperature dropped again. I have before me Chip's entry, which I copied in my journal. September 6, 1879. Temperature 17 degrees. Ice frozen 3 to 7 feet. Drift south by southeast. Starboard list of nine degrees. Next day, with broken ice piling up all along our side, the captain gave the order to unship the rudder. So the end of the first week found us a rudderless ship, drifting with the ice pack, all chance of exploration gone. Stopped at latitude 71 degrees north, which had been reached in these same waters 20 years before by an ordinary sailing ship. Next day, we let the dogs loose on the ice. Late that afternoon, a bear was sighted. Linderman, Collins, and Dan and I set off across the ice in pursuit. And an hour later, the captain came up on deck. Have Linderman muster the crew, Mr. Chip. Linderman, sir? Well, yes, of course. He has the watch now. Sorry, Captain, but Linderman's chasing a bear. He must be over a mile away by now. Linderman gone? Who gave him permission to leave? Was it Dan and I? Tell Mr. Dan and I want to see him right away. Dan's gone, too, sir. He followed Nindeman after the bear. Who'd they leave in charge on deck? I don't know, Captain. Well, this won't do. Even if we are on the ice, I can't have my crew disappearing from the ship whenever they see fit. That evening, I happened to be in the cabin with Collins. Evening, Mr. Melba. Oh, Sam. Mr. Collins, note from Cotton. All right, oh, Sam. I said all right. Yes, sir. Very well, Mr. Collins. Well, I wonder what's on His Majesty's mind tonight. Here, after no one will leave the ship without my permission, except in an emergency. A bear is not an emergency. Please initial this and return. George DeLong, Captain. Hmm. There it is, Chief. I'm trapped. <laughs> what? I'm a newspaper man, not a sailor. Back in the States, my brother warned me I shouldn't ship on this cruise as a seaman. Like a fool, I didn't believe him. 
Now it's happened. And I'm trapped. <laughs> trapped. What's ailing you, Collins? We're all trapped in the ice. You're no worse off than the rest of us. No, it's not the ice, Chief. The captain. You're all right. You're an officer. But I'm signed up as a seaman. He's got me just where he wants me. Ah, don't be a fool, cop. Don't you live in the cabin, mess with the officers, muster with the officers? What more do you want? Some gold lace on your sleeves? Now look at this order. And delivered by a Chinese cook. That order hits me and every other man on board as much as it does you. That order's aimed at me. But he can't persecute me. I'll show him. I'm covering this expedition for my paper. And when we get home, I'll have plenty to tell about the way Captain DeLong ran this expedition. The truth was that after two months in the cabin of the Jeanette, we were beginning to get tired of each other's company. This same day, the captain wrote in his log. Same faces at every meal. The same irritations pricking our nerves. The same routine day after day. No shore leave. No ports to visit. Nothing but endless ice. And no hope of change until next summer. Unless a gale breaks up the pack. Drifting willy-nilly a thousand miles from that pole, which in a blaze of publicity we had set out to conquer. September passed, and the gales we had hoped for failed to materialize. October came and went. Break in the ice! Break in the ice! Oh, oh Mr. Chip, where's the captain? Oh, captain! Captain along! Yes, what is it? Look, Collins, a crack in the ice. Look, you can see it from here. My instruments! Look, Captain, spreading. Yes. Getting wider. Now, uh, Chip, take some of the men and help Collins salvage his instruments. Quick, before it's too late. Yes. Quick! Down there! 400 feet of high! By the time we went to bed, it opened up leads of water all around us that looked like... Veins of ink in that vast white field. Didn't get much sleep. Hardly had the midwatch ended when through an open canal scarcely a hundred yards away, huge ice cliffs as high as three-story buildings were bearing down on our ship. Turn to a low hand, one load the dinghy, yes. Provision. Send a hand, please. Yes, sir. Collins, fetch your instrument, yes. Dan, uh, my log, the record, yes, sir. Nearer, nearer crept that mass of shrieking ice. Our starboard deck arched up like a cat's back under the strain. Pitch and oakum were squeezed like syrup out of the Jeanette seam. jagged path off our starboard side. The flow relaxed its grip, and by morning the deck had straightened under our feet. All right, everybody. Breakfast ready. Again, our unchanging round of dreary days. Day and night were now the same. 
the perpetual dusk of Arctic winter. No hope of escape until next summer's thaw. He turned back the captain's log. He could write in a few words. The rest of us felt and couldn't say. December 1st. On board the Jeanette. By now, we've told all our stories, read all our books, played all our games. We awake to the same faces, the same dogs, the same ice. We take the same exercise, make the same calculations of the drift, eat the same food and return each night to the same beds with the conviction that tomorrow will be the same as today. In my own diary, I find a different entry, December 24th, our first Christmas Eve on the ice. We gathered in the wardroom, a glum group, if ever there was one. Chip with a bad cold, then an hour with a black patch over his eye. The ice glared infected, Surgeon Ambler. Tired out from nursing sick officers and crew. Newcomb, more silent than ever. And the captain and myself. Only Collins' chair was empty as usual. He'd eaten and left us as soon as he could. Half hour passed, mostly in silence. Hey, what kind of a Christmas celebration do you call this? I never saw so many grouches at one table in my life. How about some mistletoe over the rigging? I might catch an Arctic mermaid like Ninky caught this albatross. Newcomb's my name. Oh, so it is. Excuse me. Ninky would have her all stuffed before any of the rest of us could get to her. Lay off with you, Dan and I. I don't think that's funny. Can't you take a little fun, Newcomb, even on Christmas? As your doctor, I prescribe a broad smile. Say three times a day before me. I'll smile when there's anything to smile about, Doctor. Well, what about this? Holy mackerel. Irish whiskey. Hand it over, Chief. <laughs> Where's the captain? Well, thanks, Chief. And Dr. Ambler. Thank you. Yeah. Here, uh, I'll pour my own. Careful, Dan and all. You've only got one good eye. I can always see well enough for this. Hey, that's enough, Dan. We're going to save some of the crew, you know. Well, Newcomb, how about you? What's it like? Is it good whiskey? <laughs> <laughs> Give Nick your written guarantee, Chief. Newcomb's my name. I'd give you another if I'd have been your old man. Don't waste any of that stuff on him, Chief. Take your whiskey and go to the devil. Well, that's a nice Christmas thought. Yeah. Well, uh, let's forget him. Can't help it, I guess. Say, how about a toast? If anyone proposes James Gordon Bennett, I'll follow Ninky. <laughs> uh, Chip's got one. I can see it fizzing. Yes, I have. I propose a toast to Emma DeLong. Thank you, Chip. I... I couldn't say it, but... I was thinking that, too. Emma DeLong. Emma DeLong. DeLong. Well, now, gentlemen, I have a toast. To the Jeanette. And next summer, her safe passage to the pole. The Jeanette in that. Jeanette. January 5th, temperature 57 below zero. Drifts still to the southeast. Sun appeared for the first time since November. Day Doc Ambler had to operate on Dan and I's eye. He has to sit in the cabin without a crack of light. We take turns talking to him. Speaker next summer, the breakup of the ice. He likes to talk about that. February first, more trouble. Repairing rusty floor plates in the boiler room. I noticed Erickson, bosun of the crew, and one of our best workers was laying down on the job. He stopped working every time I turned my back. Decided he was sick and sent for Dr. Ambler to look him over. Chief, he am not sick. He is watched. Who's watching you, Nels? What are you talking about? 
There is mutiny on the ship. Mutiny. There is mutiny on the ship. Now, look here, Erickson. Take it easy. Tell me more about it. There is mutiny, sir. On the ship, sir. Mutiny. And the crew? Say, what'd you get this, Erickson? Yeah, Chief. They tell you it is like they say. They was asked to join him. They no say yeah. They no say no. So he is watched. They got guns. They kill me for it if they tell. Erickson. Yeah? Speak fast and answer my questions. Who's their leader? They no can tell. They kill me. Oh, nonsense. Yeah, they, uh, Chief. They say they kill me. Erickson. What do you mean by they? Hey, please. They no can tell. They kill me. I'm your officer. Do you know what disobedience means? Now, come on. What's behind this? It is... Nobody hear us. Nobody. It is... Ah, oh, Sam. Ah, oh, Sam. Hello, Sam, Chinese cook. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh, Chief, it's been like I said. It's mute to me. Now, it's... Yeah? Now, it's look here. Yeah. No. Now, look at me. Yeah, right, right, right in my eyes, Nels. Yeah. Follow my fingers. I move it. Your finger? Yes. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Now, over here. Yeah. Nels. Yeah. Nels, we're going to see Dr. Amber. Oh, no, but then they kill me, sure. I won't let them, Nels. I'll take care of you. Yeah, but they kill yes. you. Yes. I know. I know. Take my hand, Nels. That's it. Yeah, yeah. That's a good fellow. Now, come along. January 6th. Four months on the ice. Part of the crew sick. A blinded officer. Now a seaman gone mad. What will this ice do to us before this winter's over? listening to a CBS presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in an original adaptation of Hell on Ice by Commander Edward Ellsberg. We pause a moment for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Hell on Ice. Commander Ellsberg's account of the disastrous polar expedition of the Jeanette Relived by Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air. On February 25th, after six months in the ice, the Jeanette's position was 74 degrees 11 minutes north. We were still drifting, waiting for the thaw to free us. March 5th, first glimpse of sunshine. Three minutes of bleak twilight, then darkness again. March 30th, temperature rising, noon reading, five above zero, ice still 14 feet thick. So June ended. July came with a fog and chilling mist. Our hopes for what the summer sun would do are beginning to fade. Temperature rises, then drops again. We find rifts in the ice at sundown and see them knit again overnight. The day grows shorter and with the men's tempers. Half the men aren't speaking to the other half. Collins quarreled with Ambler over the slamming of a door. Mr. Chip just asked Newcomb about an ice measurement he'd taken, and the little scientist wouldn't answer. Since the query was in the line of duty, Chip reported the incident to the captain. Newcomb, I have Mr. Chip's report that you failed to give him an observation. 
Well, it's in Chip's province to receive that information and enter it in the ship's records. I was going to write it on a piece of paper and hand it to him. Come, come, Newcomb. Let's forget such childish play and we'll all get along better. Don't I do my duty, sir? Yes. And I'll take good care you continue to. Very well, sir. If I do my duty, I must respectfully continue the privilege of being silent as long as I please. May I go, sir? Yes. You may go. The captain's entry on the anniversary of the day we first froze in states what all of us knew and none dared say. September 6th. Another winter on the ice. Crew look at me with a mute appeal that's pitiful to see. I know what they're wondering. Will it be another winter? Another year? Or will it be forever? But none of us talk about that. We keep it our routine as if our lives depended on October it. October 10th. Collins took his time about making his observations today. He didn't report on the ice till 20 past 12. When he finally came out, the captain was waiting for him. Well, Collins... Has it required all this time to log your noon observations? I uh, hardly know the meaning of your question, Captain DeLong. Seems to me my words are plain enough, Mr. Collins. Well, perhaps I might have done it quicker, but I didn't know my minutes were being counted for me. I've issued an order for an hour's ex exercise. I've noted for several days you've been cutting down that time. Today I'm satisfied you're doing it deliberately. Very well, if you're satisfied, Captain. I have nothing more to say. But you're doing me a great injustice. Mr. Collins! That's an impertinent comment. I don't like your manner and bearing in talking with me. Well, I don't like the manner you speak to me either. I'm your commanding officer. I'm merely informing you of a breach of discipline. And when you say that, I say it isn't true. I'm making allowances for your ignorance of naval regulations. But I advise you not to repeat that contradiction. When you charge me with violating an order, I deny it, and I'll repeat that as much as I please. Enough, Mr. Collins! When we get back to the United States, I'll have you court-martialed. Meanwhile, turn in your instruments and perform no further duties on the ship. You're under arrest. That second winter, the temperature reached 59 below. Scurvy set in. Eight men down with frostbite. Spring finally rounded the calendar. You can call it spring at ten degrees below zero in a frozen pack. In May, we saw the sun again. June 10th. My watch, 9 p.m. till midnight. 11 p.m. Disturbed by heavy shocks drumming against our hollow hull. Those words were all I had time to write. I remember the captain rushed up on deck. This season, even at midnight, the sun's above the horizon. We could see about 80 yards ahead. A lead had opened in the pack some 10 feet wide with cracks zigzagging across the surface of the ice, moving towards us. Then the float split wide apart beneath us. The Jeanette lurched wildly to port and suddenly slipped off the ice into open water. We were thrown across the deck. The ship rolled like a drunken man. Shaking in terror, we waited for the next move. Six bells, the pack started to press down that open canal. Slowly, it closed in on us. Mostly flat flows this time, but thick and jagged. And behind it, the push of endless miles of surging ice. On came the pack. No turning off this time. The ice reached our side, started to squeeze. We're thinking, Captain. Ice is coming through the side. What's that ice in the hole? Right down, ship. Leach, you're an experienced seaman. Take your report to me as if you were one. The scenes are opening below, sir. The sides will give way. It's only a question of minutes. Very well. Come with me, Chief. We started for the hatchway. At that instant, the ice got its teeth in her hull and snapped the sprinters. All hands! Hey, for the 
Commander Skip. Skip, lower boat. Yes, sir. Erickson, and the damage. What a master, Lee. Yes, sir. Unload provision. All you can save. I'll check them at the rail. Yes, sir. Keep my instruments. Target set. Come on, Lee. I need all the engine crew. Sledges, Cole. Lower them fast. Yes, sir. I'll check provision. Pemmican, three barrels. Cross it over the starboard side. Watch out below. What's the list, Skip? Yes, 30 degrees. Watch your footing, man. Careful, they were done an hour. He doesn't call, Doc. Yes, yes. Lower them both. And keep your eyes closed. Here, Iverson, you too. Hold on. Duke! What are you doing with those stuffed birds? I've only brought some of them. Lower away, boys. Over the side. She's really fast, Skipper. Better jump for it, haven't we? Abandon ship, men. Over the side. Over the side. Last to jump was the captain. Scattered over the ice like flies, we watched the doomed Jeanette. She lay far over on her beam's end. The smokestack broke off at its base. A crumbled deck bulged upwards. She slowly rose upright over the pack. The black hull began to slide down, down through the crack. Her yards banging down on the ice, stripped from the masts. Finally, the top foremost plunged through the ice and the Jeanette... Silent now. Slipped down to her Arctic grave. Situation was now desperate. Truly desperate. Thirty-three men. Cast away on drifting ice flows. Our fate totally unknown to the world we'd left two years ago beyond possible reach of relief. Five hundred miles away lay the Lena Delta. June 17th, 6 p.m. We made our start, course due south. First day's journey was a nightmare. Men and officers harnessed together, tugging at their mountainous burdens. Dogs unable to drag a single sledge. Ambler far ahead, planting black flags to mark our course. Sledges sinking in weak ice. Men wading through slush up to their knees. Lieutenant Howard, blind but pulling on a rope, fell in open water. Pulled him out before he went under the ice. Lee and Erickson collapsed in their harness. One sledge, used for dragging the sick. Chip, all in, tried to fling himself from the hospital sledge to save us weight. But we strapped him in. Chip cried like a baby at adding to our burden. Unloaded and ferried over open water dogs drowned as Cutter overturned. Only saved Snoozer, my favorite. By morning, reached our two-mile flag. Tried to get some sleep. On again at evening when the ice firmer. June 23rd. At dawn, the first sledge reached Ambler's 12-mile flag. The men stumbled into camp and lay exhausted on the ice. Temperature 34 below. The captain called me into his tent. Well, Chief, what do you think? There's hardly enough food to last 60 days, Captain. We've only made 12 miles in seven days. See, now that we've... Don't say it. There's something else I think you ought to know. With Dan and Chip knocked out, you're the only officer left I can confide in outside of Ambler. He's got his hands full with the sick. That doesn't sound like good news. Well, shoot, brother. In six days, we've made 12 miles south. Right? I'm just about, sir. Well, we're 20 miles further north tonight than the day we started. What? Wait, Captain. Let me get this straight, you see. We're north of where the Jeanette sank? Twenty miles. The Norwest Drift's got us in tow. Are you sure? We saw me shooting the sun, two meridian, altitude, and a couple of Sumner lines, and they all checked. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I had to spill it, but some officer must know where we are. In case something happens to me. Sure, Captain. Sure, I'm trying to clip my breath, but I'm all right now. Uh, don't tell anyone else. 
The men found out I I couldn't get them to lay a hand on another slave. Yeah. They just sit here and wait to die. Got a plan, Captain. What is it? Yeah. Look at this map. Back here is where the Jeanette sank. And here's where we are today. That's right. 77 degrees, 43 minutes north. We're walking against the drift and the pack's moving faster than we are. I'm changing our course from south to southwest. That way we've got a chance of reaching the edge. One chance in a hundred. The one we've got to take. How about rations? They'll never hold up. We'll have to stretch them. Now, how thin can you cut them? You're working the men, and that's for you to decide. Well... Well, Skipper, cut a third off. That'll last 90 days instead of 60. I'm willing to try. I knew I could count on you, Chief. I always can. Now, Chief, you're to be my witness at a little ceremony, remember? A flag. This is Delong's flag. Yeah, that's so. The point farthest north. We hope this is it. Pull the other end, Chief. We'll unfurl it for... for Emma. I think she knew, Chief. Sure, Captain. The North Star. He's right over our head. Things equal to the same thing. She'll be glad. Now let's fold it up now so nobody will know that we had it out. Else they might guess the reason. Got any tobacco left, Captain? I can stand a pipe for. I don't feel like supper. Or is it breakfast? Hand your pipe over. I'll fill it up. Thanks, brother. Chief, this is a grand country to learn patience in. For 91 days, we struggled on over the ice going southwest, now towards the Lena Delta, through fog, day after day. Ferrying across leads, pulling through slush our clothes, constantly soaked in ice water. The most we covered in one day was six miles, some days not more than two. The men growing weaker every day from frostbite and scurvy. On September 9th, 91 days after the sinking of the Jeanette, we reached the edge of the ice in the open sea. Crawled into camp and then DeLong mustered his crew, called the roll for the last time. That night he held divine service. Even the sick joined in. Only Collins stayed in his tent. Thank God for thy mercies. We pray thee for deliverance to our homes and to thy continued service. Amen. Eternal Father, strong to save, whose arm has bound the restless way, who bids the Charts 96 miles of open sea. The first boat, Captain DeLong commanding, Surgeon Ambler, Collins, 11 seamen. The second cutter, manned by Lieutenant Chip with seven seamen. Third, under my command, Dan and R, Newcomb, and eight seamen. Strong east wind was blowing, and white caps were running everywhere. We took in reefs to stay near the other two boats. DeLong signaled, and we tried to douse sail, but the racing seas combed over our stern. Never! Never! Hey, you! 
I can't hold back, Captain. Neither run nor smoke. She'll smoke, Captain. I can't hold her back. Still away, then. By evening, the sea was running mountainous. Our little boat rose dizzily to every crest and plunged down in the trough as the wave rolled by. The other boats were falling behind. I glanced back at Chip a thousand yards to windward. As I looked, an immense sea swept over his boat and she broached, lying helplessly broadside to the gale. No boat ever beat a mile dead to windward against such waves. Long before we could even get our boat into the wind on the first tack. The icy waters had ended the agony of Chip and his men. Way astern was the captain's cutter. Night fell. That, too, faded from sight and we were left alone. Eleven frozen men in a tiny whale boat. In utter blackness. By morning, the ocean calmed and in the gray light we saw... Land, less than a mile away, and smoke rising. But there was no sign of the captain's boat. The story of the last days of Captain DeLong and his men was pieced together many months later from the captain's diary and the ship's papers that were found in his camp. One hundred and thirty-fifth day, around October 1st. This morning reached Lena Delta. Boat overturned in shallows. All stores lost. Only chance is to make Kumak set 95 miles south by my chart. Doctor says some of the men can't walk even a mile. They'll have to. Tonight ate the last of the pemmican. 136th day. Erickson dropped in his tracks. Both feet frozen. Flesh falling off in his boots. We cut him some crutches out of driftwood. Let me stay, Captain. Don't move me. My legs is killing me. Oh, crutches no use. They won't only die quick. Get up, Erickson. You think I'm going to leave you up for our carrier? Oh, please, Captain. Up, I tell you. We're going on. 137th day. This morning, an ambler shot a reindeer. Men too famished to wait for fire. Ate the beast raw. Gave the bone to snoozer. 138th day. Trapped by open water. Have to cross. We try to build raft. The men are broken. Can scarcely lift planks. I drive them hard. What's the matter, Leach? Lashings are loose. There ain't enough logs to float it. Then haul the lashings tighter. Your ship's carpenter. I hauled it as tight as I could. Do as I say. Stop talking back. You won't even let us die in peace. You're not human. Leach, another word out of you, and I'll have you court-martialed. You hear me? Yes, sir. 139th day. Raft completed. Crossed water. Found a deserted fishing hut other side of the bay. Put up overnight. Raging blizzard outside. At midnight, Erickson died. Sea burial. Fired a volley with our last rifle. 144th day. About the 9th of October. Today sent Nindeman and Noros, the two strongest men left, toward Kumak Cirque. They may get through and send help. Today, killed my dog, Snoozer, for food. Dog never whimpered. Too far gone. Men weakening fast. 
145th day. Collected driftwood. Built fire. We wait here, hoping all hands feeble, but cheerful. God help us. 147th day. Still no game. One spoonful of glycerin for food. After supper, all united in saying Lord's Prayer. 152nd day. Alexei dying. Doctor baptized him. Mr. Collins' birthday. 40 years old. Food. Willow tea and two old boots. 153rd day. Calm. Mild. Snow falling. About sunset, uh, Lexi died. Covered him with ensign and laid him on a crib. Lee dying. Our Sam dying. Doctor rubs their hands to keep them warm. 156th day. Found Leech dead in the morning. Still sitting up between the doctor and myself. Iverson laughs. Laughs. His mind is gone. Too weak to carry the body out on the ice. 157th day. Near the end of, of October. Very little hope. Said part of the divine service. At sunset, our Sam died. He still leans over his kettle. We can't move him. Hundred and sixtieth day. Dressler died during the night. Ambler now weakening. God, help us. 164th day. Iverson's laughing stops. Hamlet crawls over to him. Feels his pulse. Dead. 167th day. Mr. Collins dying. Mr. Collins dying. The captain's last entry in that fateful book. No word of himself. His frozen fingers scrawled their last words. Mr. Collins. Dying. Months of searching finally brought us to that gale-swept hill. There I made out, stiff and stark above the snow, an upraised arm. The arm belonged to Captain DeLong, half buried in the snow. I figured he'd tossed his journal to safety on higher ground, and his stiffening arm had frozen in that gesture. I was right. Journal was just above, and his face was calm as if his work was done. Atop a rocky promontory, looking to the north, towering 400 feet above the great bay of the Lena Delta and far beyond the reach of any possible flood. I prepared for my captain and his crew their final resting place. Above that rocky cairn, I raised a massive cross, 25 feet high, hewn from a driftwood spar salvaged from the bay below. And on the spreading arms of that cross, I cut the names of those who were to rest beneath it. 
Then when all was ready on April 6th, 1882, on that gale-swept mountain over the Lena, we buried them. We lifted the thin bodies from the sledges. Tenderly laid them out on a bed of snow inside the tomb. Captain DeLong at one end, the others in order of rank. Surgeon Ambler, Mr. Collins, Lee, Cack, Gortz, Boyd, Iverson, Dressler, and last at the other end. Our Sam. And then, sorrowfully sealing up the cairn, we left them to their rest. Among the Siberian snows looking out over the Lena's great bay at that desolate cape below, which had witnessed their last agony, and northward across that polar sea, which he had valiantly given his life to conquer, DeLong and his men of the Jeanette lay at last beneath a huge cross on the rocky cairn. With the fierce arctic glares they had so often bravely faced. And the winds mournfully wailing their eternal dirge. The Columbia Broadcasting System has brought to its coast-to-coast audience a reenactment of the early expedition to the North Pole as dramatized by Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air. The play was adapted from Commander Edward Ellsberg's historical account of the saga of the Jeanette, as told in his book, Hell on Ice. This was the 14th consecutive broadcast in the weekly CBS series featuring Broadway's newest and most widely acclaimed theatrical producing company on the air. Orson Welles adapted the story for radio and directed the entire production. In the cast tonight were Thelma Schnee as Emma DeLong, Clayton Collier as Lieutenant Chip, Joseph Cotton as Lieutenant Dannenauer, William Allen as Dr. Ambler, Frank Reddick as Art Sam, Howard Smith as Collins, Al Swenson as Erickson, Ray Collins as Captain DeLong, and Orson Welles as Lieutenant Melville. The original music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and Davidson Taylor supervised the production for CBS. This is Dan Seymour speaking. Next week at this same hour, 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we invite you to listen to the 15th of the weekly performances by Orson Welles, and the Mercury Theater on the Air. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.